Hi, this is Pastor Nadine. Welcome to Midweek Worship for Wednesday, May 13th. If you do have your bulletin in front of you, I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God consoles us in all our affliction so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. In our weekly Sunday series from 1 John, we have heard again and again about God's immense love for us. A love that is so great that he sent his only son and that through him we might know and understand the depth of his love and the forgiveness of sins. So let us come before the Lord with our prayer of confession, offering this prayer with humble and contrite hearts. So let us pray first together and then silently. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, Cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and our strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. The great good news is this, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Now may the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen. We're continuing our study of the Gospel of Mark and today we're going to be in Mark chapter 14 verses 32 to 52. So if you do have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn to chapter 14 now and listen as I read from chapter 14, verses 32 to 52. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, 
Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, but you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we find ourselves at a very crucial moment in the life of Jesus. The moment where he has shared the Passover meal with his disciples. They've gone to the Mount of Olives together to sing a hymn. In fact, they sung the hymn and then they went to the Mount of Olives. But after that, Jesus said, and this is just in the previous chapter, and Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters. And here in this next, next chapter, we see that this abandonment is taking place, that all of it is just as Jesus said. In fact, we notice that the three he took with him, Peter and James and John, have already struggled with understanding what Jesus has been saying about his death, about coming into the kingdom. James and John, in fact, tried to obtain some sort of special honor. He said, well, when you come into the kingdom of your father, would you not bestow on us honors that we might sit one at your right and one at your left? Not understanding the suffering and death that would precede his ascension. Not understanding at all what he meant about the kingdom. And what about Peter? Well, we know that Peter struggled um, with, his, with his own words, he, he betrayed himself. He said, oh, I would never deny you, Jesus, right? He said it more than once. And yet just, again, prior to this, he says to, to, to Peter specifically, truly, I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter says, no, of course not. I would never do that. But soon we will see that Jesus is abandoned in several ways. So let us look at this passage a little more closely. So they go into this garden, Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And it's clear to them that he is distressed. He says distressed and agitated. In fact, he says to them that he is very deeply grieved even unto death. And all that he asks of them is that they stay with him and stay awake. And we've heard this call to stay awake as well, when I believe back in chapter 13, where Jesus reminds, the, reminds them through telling them the story of the servants who are kept in charge of the house and to keep, it, keep awake, to keep prepared and, and ready for the return of the master, for he may come home at any time. And the final word there was to keep awake. And here again, these words, all I ask you, as my disciples, as ones who have said that they believe that I am the Messiah, that said they would follow me, who have answered this call, all I ask of you is to stay awake with me in my hour of need. And yet we find that they, they could not. As we move a little further through the story, we hear Jesus calling out to God the Father from his humanity, from his, his desire to let this suffering pass him by. It's a very much out of, out of his humanity that this cry arises. But almost in the same breath as he asks, remove this cup from me if it's possible. But in, in that same sentence, Yet not what I want, but what you want. So already we see this tremendous and very stark contrast between the faithfulness of Jesus, the, the obedience to the Lord, that it is God's will that he desires to be fulfilled more than his own. 
if it is God's will, but not what I want, he says to the Lord, to God, but what you want. And there he is with these disciples who are struggling to do the simplest thing, to follow the simplest of requests. And so when he comes to them and he says, notice he says, Simon, sort of the pre-apostolic name for Peter, right? Before he is, you are Peter the Rock. He was Simon. And he addresses him as Simon, which must have been a little bit startling. Must have caught his attention a little bit. But he says, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Could you not do this for me? And he goes away again to pray again to the Father. And he comes back and he finds that they are asleep again. And here we have yet another abandonment of Jesus because they don't even know what to say to him. In verse 40, at the end uh, of that sentence, uh, he comes and finds them sleeping. Their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to say to him. They leave him hanging without any sort of defense for their actions. They can't even speak. It's another form of abandonment in that moment. And he comes a third time and he says, enough, they're coming for me. And finally, of course, the disciples are roused because there is now this crowd surrounding them who've come to arrest Jesus. And here is their moment, right? To, to protect him, to, to surround and lift him up, right? And yet, that is not what they're going to do. And the one who comes with them is none other than Judas, who comes with the guise of friendship, right? With the guise of one who loves Jesus, who says to him, Rabbi, and gives, it, gives him a kiss. But that kiss is a betrayal. It's the signal that this is the one that they should arrest. So the one who comes in friendship and love is coming as a betrayer. Again, this reversal, this stark contrast. And by the end of that first paragraph, it reads, all of them deserted him and fled. Everyone has left, except we have this very curious couple of verses at the end that there is a certain young man, and we have no idea who that young man is, but he's dressed only in a linen cloth. And since they suspect he must be a follower of Jesus, they attempt to, to seize him as well, and he manages to get loose from his cloth and runs away completely naked. So there's a lot of speculation on who this young man might be or what he symbolizes, but but perhaps he is more of a symbol for all of the others who would panic and flee when the Lord was arrested. So if we just left it with abandonment and betrayal, it would be a very, very heavy and difficult passage for us to, to find hope in. I think in part we do need to be disturbed and unsettled because we can see ourselves in the actions of all of these men, all of these disciples. We can see ourselves in the fact that one, one time that Jesus says to them that they need to stay awake and, and this is their moment, and yet they can't manage to do as he asks. Even for an hour, they can't stay awake. It emphasizes that sort of abandonment that they can't pay attention, that they aren't aware enough of what is transpiring, of, of the momentous occasion that is occurring with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in his plea to God and his acceptance and willingness to go to the cross to see through on what has been laid before him, that path. He's going to see that through, obedient unto death for our sake, and yet this is, this is lost on them. And so we, we find ourselves in that 
don't we? We see ourselves in them in that moment when we let Jesus down, when we don't follow through on our promises to be his disciples and to, to follow where he will go to do what he will ask, the requests that he has for us to follow him. Sometimes we don't. And then we have the betrayer, the one who turns away from the Lord, who does not follow at all and who intentionally has grieved God. We have done that, each one of us. At some point, we have probably done that as well. We have grieved God with some intentional act. And then lastly, of course, we have the young man who runs away. And as I said, perhaps he stands in for all of the rest of us in those moments when we panic. We panic before the Lord and we run. We run out of confusion or fear or, or just not able to live into our own promises and we flee. So we have this, we have this story of abandonment and we have a story of faithfulness. The faithfulness of the father and the faithfulness of the son. And so I just wanted to bring a little bit from a commentary by Lamar Williamson to help us sort of understand this a little and frame it a bit more. He writes, the passage as a whole plays out three ways of abandoning Jesus. One way is by apathy, sleeping through the critical moments of life, unaware that one's discipleship is being tested. And of course, that's Peter, James, and John. Another is by conscious betrayal of the Lord under the mask of friendship, which of course is Judas. And third is the flight in a time of pressure or panic, the young man at the very end. These three patterns of forsaking Jesus are reenacted in every age by individuals and by groups of Christians for whom the text is a constant repeated call to faithful discipleship. And then of course he points out, Mamar points out that over and against these terrible examples uh, of discipleship, that there is Jesus. And we see, as he writes, his human struggle with the will of God serves as criterion and magnet for struggling disciples of every time. Readers may recognize themselves in the three failures, but they are addressed by the presence and power of Jesus at the heart of the text. And then he goes on and he says, beyond its warning against the faithlessness of disciples and beyond its exhortation to be faithful like Jesus, the text proclaims good news about God. Jesus in Gethsemane is the parable of God. His agony shows what redemption costs God. His steadfastness reflects a God who holds to his saving purpose despite all that humankind does to the contrary. At Gethsemane, as on the cross, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. The good news of Gethsemane is the faithfulness of God. I hope you'll spend a little more time with this passage and think of these contrasts, but think of them held in that beautiful gift, an example of faithfulness in Christ that we see, and remembering his words to God the Father, but not what I want, but what you want. And may that be our touchstone and our guide in our own lives of discipleship. Now I would like to invite you into a time of prayer together. I hope that you have received the email from Dr. Rich that gives specific concerns for our congregation. So I hope that you will turn to that and lift up those specific situations and people in your own prayers as well. 
there's certainly much that we can pray for. We continue to struggle with the ongoing virus in our midst. We continue to uh, face decisions on how to move forward. We certainly ask for prayers and decision making for our leaders and for our church. I invite you to join me now in prayer. Most Holy Father, we give you thanks for your divine mercy, for your infinite patience, for your incredible faithfulness. We see that you always keep your promises, that you always stay awake, that you are always there, ready to receive us, and that you will receive us again and welcome us back when we fall away when we disappoint, when we rebel, when we seek our own will and not yours. Still, you forgive and welcome us back, giving us another chance to follow. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us every day and every moment, helping to guide us in that path. We lift up those in our midst who are struggling with poor health, for those who are facing surgeries or recovering from surgeries. We lift up young mothers with new children. We give thanks for the new life that has been brought into the world. And we pray for those parents as they raise their children to be followers of Christ, members, of God's family. We lift up those who are in positions of healing, who are doing all that they can to bring comfort and release from illness. Be with them, Lord, and give them strength. Give them rest. Be with our leaders as they attempt to make wise decisions. Help us in our church as we discern the path forward, one that is safe for all, one that is inclusive and welcoming. Help us to make the best possible decisions. And be with all of those who are still isolated at home, who may feel lonely or depressed, for those who have not seen their families in quite some time. Be with us all, Lord, reminding us again and again of your faithful presence, of your great healing, of your comfort, of the wisdom that you grant us. May we listen and follow as you direct us. And as we pray together, Gracious God, source of all healing, in Jesus Christ you heal the sick and mend the broken. Hear our prayers for those who are in the hospital. Hear our prayers for those who are lonely or depressed. Hear our prayers for those suffering from failing bodies. Send your spirit to bring healing, comfort, encouragement, and wholeness to those in need. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for sharing this time with me. And as you're watching this, know that others have been watching as well and that we are still connected in this way. And I pray that you will go out from this video time together, from this midweek worship time that we have had to love and serve the Lord, that you will Go out and share the peace of Christ with others. And may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.